I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Sagar for suggesting I uh, speak. And I'd like to thank Dr. Rockwell for inviting me to speak. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining me for a little while. I hope I don't alienate you with my uh, sometimes provocative uh, issues that I'm dealing with, some uh, quite existential uh, that we could use some help with. Uh, I'm gonna talk about um, global small wildcat conservation. I created my nonprofit in uh, 2004. Uh, and um, we're based solely on uh, our financial partners' support. My colleagues write the proposals. I have colleagues all over the world I work with. And, um, but, but Small Wildcat Conservation Foundation depends solely on our uh, financial partners. So we have two kinds of partners. One is like Sauter, the in situ partners, and we have financial partners. We typically don't have donors. Here we go. So I wanna talk about community-based conservation because that's what we do. We don't do research. You know what research is? Peer reviewed, I've published more than 160 papers. And I've written five books, but I, I really don't do research. I do, but it's part of my, my job, I guess but the conservation comes first. As with all wildlife, the small cats have their share of uh, threats. They come in many forms, they morph. Uh, here's an ocelot with mange, that's threat number three, disease, I would say in Central and South America. The greatest threat we face is disease transmission from domestic animals, both cats and dogs. Uh, we no longer refer to something as uh, canine distemper. It's, it's carnivore distemper. It affects all carnivores, not just dogs, not just canines. So we have uh, extensive programs for uh, attacking disease, uh, trying to get rid of disease in Central and South America. It's a huge problem. Uh, if if uh, global governments did their jobs, I don't think there would be any need for any NGOs. We know how that goes. And we face all these other threats. Retaliatory killing is a big one. Um, road kill. Some cats are used for traditional medicine still. And uh, an existential threat of climate change. That can't, as a small conservation organization, we can't do much about. We have to live with it. So, Really wildlife, human wildlife conflict for us is a two-sided coin because when, when uh, humans and wildlife come into contact, there's only one side that loses. Um, and we try to mitigate that to stop it from happening. So here's some of the things we have to deal with like illegal bushmeat hunting, disease again, we have electric fences and other deterrents that people, uh, put up that kill lots of animals, not just the small cats. There's a fur trade, there's overfishing, particularly for our fishing cats in Asia, uh, poisoning, recreational hunting, people go out and just kill stuff. And there's uh, retaliatory killing for small cats preying on, on uh, domestic animals. So I'll show you an example from uh, Mexico. You'll recognize this as an ocelot doing what ocelots do. And with that predation event, the uh, that's a dead ocelot because no people would, would uh, tolerate it. Fortunately, they only lost one chicken. Typically when a cat gets into a, a hen house, it kills all the chickens and then it takes only one. But that's a problem that we know how to solve. And we're solving that problem all around the world. And I'll show you how. Here's another one from Brazil. So this is Joffrey's cats that you're looking at. I was there not too long ago, last week. This is my colleague, uh, Felipe Peters. He's working on his PhD. 
but he's also doing a lot of conservation. So here's the Joffrey's cats entering the hen house. And this goes on night after night, every night. Good size hen there. There's another one that was predating um, the hen house. But we know how to solve this problem and we're solving this problem all over the world. They can't get in, no predation event, no dead cats. It's that simple. Anybody with a hammer can fix these problems. And if you, if, if, if you want to study these small cats, the very first thing you'll learn is what's the threat and what are you doing to stop it? Because if you don't, you won't have anything left to study. So who can solve all these problems? Well, here's my colleague in uh, Peru, Pedro. He was a re he's a resort owner. Before that, he owned a t-shirt factory. He has no degree and he's doing outstanding work protecting the small wild cats in, in uh, where he lives in Peru. Patoy in um, Sierra Leone, Pern in Nepal. Here's Cindy Hurtado, uh, she's Peruvian. And Sonan from Nepal, who, who uh, Sagar knows. All these people are figuring out what are the threats and how do you mitigate those threats? That's what they do. Every day, that's what they're thinking about. So when I went to Chile in 1997, 1998, for my work on uh, my PhD from, in wildlife ecology and conservation from the University of Florida, we had one picture of one living individual of the little thief, the Wienia. That's all we had was this picture. And with this picture, a lot of myth was created. We don't see them because they're nocturnal. Uh, he's on a tree, they must be uh, arboreal. On and on the stories went, and this was our belief about this cat. You know, basically, we didn't know anything. The, the uh, habitat that I worked in was highly fragmented. It was on Chiloé Island, which is a large island off the coast of Chile. Um, and you can see free ranging hens and, and, and cows. And those free ranging hens are threat number one. Here's one that's living at a rescue center uh, just north of Villa Rica, Chile. So we work with rescue centers. These cats come in injured, often hit by cars, and my colleagues at the rescue centers do their best to try to save them and release them. So this one was successfully saved. I must call attention to Sagar's work in uh, Nepal. He's fixed his share of hen houses on behalf of fishing cats. Um, not only do they prey on fish, but they'll, they'll prey on just about anything smaller than them. They won't back down from a large dog, but Sagar has fixed many a hen house and saved, uh, saved a lot of cats by doing that. And these people are still generating NSF income from the their um, so starting in March, I'll from their work on the, the uh, raising raising chickens. Hopefully, I can hold on to the fifty thousand I'm getting now. So, I... you're asking me how am I doing that, right? Um, here's our colleague in in Nepal, uh, Ganesh, and he started a fish bank program. The fishing cats were taking people's fish from their backyard fish ponds. And Ganesh came up with the idea of a fish hatchling program where if the people are suffering a lot of predation, he first fixes, prevents the cats from entering their, um, their fish ponds. And then he gives people bags of fish. And he's turned people that were killing fishing cats into people that are helping us save fishing cats by working with their neighbors. Very impressive program. Well, my experience in Chile was as follows. How do you stop the killing to do your study? So the first about two and a half to three months, 
I was able to find a place that had the cat by asking local people if they were losing chicken. All I saw was dead cats. In. So for the first about two and a half to three months, I simply repaired and fixed hen houses. I did nothing else. So this is a cat completely unknown to science. What am I doing fixing hen houses? I should be studying the cat. But if I didn't fix those hen houses, I wouldn't have anything left to study because they were predating on people's chickens. They were getting bonked over the head with a broom. That was the end of them. Uh, so the woman here on the right in the red shirt said, well, you can study them here on my forest, but when you leave, you must kill every one of them or take them with you. Get rid of them, I don't want them. They've killed all my chickens. I agree against the wishes of my uh, esteemed Chilean colleagues. I said, okay, I'll, I'll accept it. And when we caught the male that was uh, predating her chickens, shown, I'm holding it there on the right, I said, okay, go, go, please go to the house and, and bring out um, Mrs. Barr's daughter and, uh, and bring her out because I, I want to show her the cat. My colleague said, no, she's going to strangle it. Of course, it's drugged. Um, that's why I'm able to hold it, otherwise it would rip my face off. Uh, but um, they came out and you can see there, she's pointing at it there. And um, this is what happened. She went from wanting to kill every one of them to wanting to pet every one of them. She said it was the most beautiful cat she'd ever seen. She said she wanted to visit all the schools in the area and inform the families of the children that if anybody killed any of these cats, they would have to answer to her because they all belong to her. She became my, my most vocal sponsor. She visited all the schools and she never let up. She single-handedly made a difference. This young kid that was with me, um, he uh, helped me capture this one cat and uh, release it. And I went to visit his, uh, his family about 15 years later. I saw this picture on the wall in the kitchen frame. It's this picture. And I asked, well, where, where, where is Eduardo? And, and his mother said, oh, he's in university. He wants to be a biologist and do what you do. So you never know what kind of impact you're gonna have. But I can tell you, if you set out just to study the animals, go to Mongolia, don't speak Mongolian, don't talk to anybody, just study the cats, you'll be able to do it. You'll be able to come back and write up your PhD, but you'll have no damn difference. It won't make any bit of difference. We've got to change things now. We're to have these small cats and other creatures around. So the bottom line for me was I could have left Chile away and returned home, go back to UF. I had resolved the human wildlife conflict. The threat reduction was successful. I fixed as many hen houses as I could. No research needed. We didn't know anything about the cat and I could have left and we still wouldn't know anything about the cat. I hear that good conservation rests on good research. Don't believe it. It's Kool-Aid. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Unfortunately, nobody receives a degree for doing conservation. You just don't, you gotta do the research. You have to publish. It's a university setting, this is what you have to do. Conservation is a big waste of time. It takes time to build those hen houses. I didn't learn anything about the weenie when I was fixing hen houses. So that would have been greatly distressful to my PhD advisor, Mel Sundquist. Um, but I reduced the threat and that was, a, that was the most satisfying thing I did. So the take home lesson is let conservation questions motivate research. So I changed my whole focus. Why were the weenies so rarely observed? 
Were they really nocturnal? Why did males invariably get into trouble? Never the females. Never once did a female get hit over the head with a broom for stealing chickens. It was always the males. Males have a tough life, as we all know. And um, how did land use and change impact their survival? It did. So my take home messages were that, you know, conservation is really a social science. We need to work with people. We need to deal with the root problem. Why are people killing the small cats? And we have to fix those problems. Nobody is going to fix those problems if we don't do the work. In order to do that, I was making people's lives easier. I fixed a problem. They weren't losing chickens. I was making their lives easier. And as a result, they turned around and started helping me. The woman is visiting schoolhouses. People were asking me, why, am I, why is this gringo carrying around this funny antenna? Can you show my son what you're doing? Yes, they began to help me. Completely, entirely different situation than three months previously. I hope I'm getting more provocative here. Um, so let conservation motivate research. Uh, here's another example. Long ago, there was just one species of tiger cat in South America. Then there were two, we split them. There's the yellow and the green there in the map. And now uh, this week, we're splitting them again. So we've gone from one species to two species to three species. Um, it's in scientific reports this week. You'll see an, a, an author list of about 30 people. Anybody um, that's going to be deciding about whether to make it a new species or not is on the publication. We've loaded the dice to come out favorably. Uh, the governments have already accepted this splitting, but the IUCN Cat Specialist Group hasn't reviewed the results yet, so it uh, hasn't gone along yet. But all of us that are co-authors on that paper will probably be asked to vote. So here, and here's the good news. The missing link that is not in our paper is the molecular analysis. And um, our conservation needs dictate that we need that molecular analysis because preliminary results indicate there might be four species. And remember, every time we split a species, the population is reduced. So we're going up in the level of, of need. But we don't wait to do stuff. We are on the ground already. We're not waiting for results. So here's the question. What are the threats and what is being done to reduce those threats? That's the conservation question. And that's where all work should begin, not end. So we have working groups for all the small cats in the Americas. We have the African Golden Cat Working Group in 22 countries in uh, Central Africa, the African Rainforest Belt. We have the Fish and Cat Conservation Alliance of which we have an upstanding partner here uh, working in Nepal. We have uh, projects in every range country from Pakistan to Cambodia. We have a Clouded Leopard Working Group and um, Rusty Spotted Cat Working Group, Manuel Working Group. Uh, Manuel is, a, I think it's a, something like 12 time zones. We have projects across the Asian steppe. Here's uh, Tayasa at Haya with the Fishing Cat Conservation Alliance, leading a group of students. Um, she was, her efforts led to uh, the state of Bengal uh, declaring the fishing cat the, the state animal. So she doesn't, do that. She organizes groups to do that, to push it through. If she goes and asks, the government will say, no, go away. But when groups of students and groups of other people get together and demand change, change happens. And Tayasi is a master of creating this, this uh, bringing people together and creating change, making change. She won the Future for Nature Award uh, two years ago an award given out to only three people in the world. She won it. She's the only conservationist I worked with that's had a handshake
from the prime minister of her country for her conservation efforts. These are high powered people. In, um, in Cambodia, uh, Vanessa is doing a great job. There's Giri Mala in India, working with the fishermen. And basically we work with these people to make their lives easier, to clean up the environment. And in doing so, we create people to help us carry out our conservation uh, actions. You'll see a lot of kids in these pictures. Here's um, my colleague, Ashan Turugula in Sri Lanka. There's a fishing cat on the sign. We get a lot of selfies. In fact, so many selfies that the transportation department wanted to know who put up that sign and what are all these selfies? And that got Ashan put on the transportation board to make sure that culverts are put under roads before they're built. The sign, you think it's there to slow traffic down, it doesn't. It's put there for other reasons, much higher goals about building roads properly, uh, make them favorable for wildlife, not barriers. We work with rescue centers all around the world because they're our, our first line of defense. We know what happens if we find a cat that's been hit in the head with a car, we know where to go. Everywhere in the world we work, we know where to go. We make a phone call, the vets are ready. Here's a little um, rusty spotted cat. Ashan is the master of creating networks. You'll notice he's wearing his Mohammed bin Zayed species fund shirt. A lot of his funding comes from Mohammed bin Zayed species conservation fund on whose review board I serve. No cat left behind. Um, our work in Nepal, I mean, uh, excuse me, Mongolia, uh, Uyana and Okan Bayer leading our project there. It's in uh, Southeast Mongolia. There are no snow leopards causing any distractions. And we work there with the palace cat or Manul. Now um, we have a Manul tours. So we're taking people to uh, Mongolia every summer to see up close and personal these uh, manual in the wild. And we we're seeing 15 a day, often from two meters away. If you wanna see manual or palace cats, we know where to go. We began by uh, reintroducing um, Mongolian marmots, IUCN red list endangered, that were hunted out for fur, fat, and food. They Basically, the hunters would go out, kill them, sell them for fur, fat, and food. They get $8. We paid uh, the master hunter $20 to bring us back live ones. He's now uh, driving uh, for our manual tours. Um, and he was delighted to bring back as many as we could reintroduce. So we had the local people uh, dig the holes. We had the kids name the marmots, thus conferring immunity from the hunters. And now we have uh, Mongol tours. So the, the uh, population of Mongolian marmots is now self-sustaining, it's spreading. And this is the way you'll see um, the Mongol or palace cats. Uh, these are, this is three kittens. Uh, we've seen um, these eight pound cats with six kittens. Uh, and you can see the landscape there is, uh, well, there are not a lot of trees. Think boulders. And how was it all achieved? Um, well, it was working with all these people. And who knew that as a reward, the community only wanted volleyballs and volleyball nets? Who would know that except a Mongolian? And that's why I work with Mongolians in Mongolia in Sagar in Nepal, and Ashan in Sri Lanka, and Flavia in, in, in Brazil, and Cindy in Peru, is the local people know what we don't know. And they can speak what we can't speak. We don't send expats to do the jobs that locals can do.
To change the future, we have to work with kids. So we do a lot of murals. We play a lot of games during our vaccination campaign. This is what the kids are doing. The African golden cat, again, different problem, poaching, not disease. This is Badru Mugerwa in Uganda. He runs our African golden cat uh, program, 22 countries, every range country represented. Nobody goes to Africa to see African golden cat. They go to Africa to see lions and leopards and cheetahs and elephants and rhinos. You will never see an African golden cat. They're way too elusive, or black-footed cat for that matter. So but the people are very open, and Badru interviewed them. Why do you poach? You know it's illegal. Why do you do it? They freely admit. And they say, guards and patrols just make my life more difficult, and when I work around them. So you can hire all the guard staff you want, but it's not going to work. As soon as they stop, they go, they'll just continue their poaching. You know that if the police set up a roadblock between you and your favorite grocery store, you would find a way around it. You would. We all would. Well, these guys are the same way. You can put all the guards you want out there. It's not going to work. Chances are his brother's one of the patrol. What can you raise? How, how can we help? What can you raise? They said they could raise pigs. Great. How many pigs? Let's start with one community. One community needs 30 pigs. We deliver 100. For us, it's very cheap. For them, it's expensive. We can do it. Let's make a difference. Let's change their lives. And pigs are far too valuable to just left roaming around. Leopards would pick them off. They tie them up at night. They make sure they know where they are. And pigs can do what a dollar can. One pig can turn into seven pigs in a year. A dollar can't do that. So it's, it's great that they can raise pigs. We now have a piglet program in uh, with 11 communities, 1,300 members. That's just in Uganda. This also works in other places in, the, in, the, uh, in Central Africa. In South Sudan, it's goats instead of pigs. Whatever they can raise, we can supply. People say, oh, but if the goats get away, they'll spread all over the landscape. Well, there's this thing called the leopard. And it's the val it would be like you losing your car. You're not going to lose your car, and they're not going to lose their, lose their goats. We also have a micro loan program where we set up a fund, let local people manage the loan program. We don't, we don't, we don't manage it, they manage it. If it fails, it's on them, not us. And you know what? By doing that, they never fail. If it was on us, it would always fail. We also have a mobile dental clinic because rural people like this um, don't see dentists. We got a truck, a used truck. We outfitted it with used uh, dental equipment. And we asked the students at the local university, the dental students at uh, a local university, can you deliver these dental services to rural people? They jumped on it because they only see city people. They don't see teeth of rural people. They're adding to their experience. They're getting credit for their degree programs. Lots of experience. And the people, well, they want that mobile dental clinic. So it's mobile. If we don't see an increase in wildlife with our camera traps around these villages, then we suspect, well, maybe there's poaching. And uh, the mobile dental, cl mobile dental clinic can just drive by. In fact, it's the women that are, that are really the anti-poaching staff. They're, they're a force to be dealt with. They want that mobile dental clinic for their kids. They'll do anything to get rid of the poachers in their village. It's, it's really humbling. One poacher, uh, when he went out to collect his, his animals from his snares, the women started dismantling his house and burning it. He wasn't welcome. We have a vaccination campaign funded by a, a foundation in California where we are uh, vaccinating and neutering uh, 
people's cats and dogs, trying to reduce the threat of diseases. It's a huge problem. I saw uh, on a trip to Brazil, I saw 12 uh, Maine wolves with mange. So it's not just the cats, it's all wildlife. Every, every uh, cat we, that we take blood from, every wild cat we take has been exposed to some domestic disease, every one. Fortunately, they survive, or at least we haven't seen any symptoms. It could be that, that uh, the different number of chromosomes. These cats in South America uh, in the genus Leopardus have 18 pairs of chromosomes. All other cats on earth have 19 pairs. So it could be domestic cats with 19 pairs and Leopardus with 18 pairs. They have some sort of immunity, but we don't know. How do we know our projects are working? Or do we just want to believe that they're working? So we monitor wildlife with trail cameras. This is different from research, right? With, re with camera traps, you put out your cameras, you want to collect some data. We, we also want to collect data, but we use it for a different purpose. We want to know, are we seeing more wildlife as a result of our efforts? Yes or no? We use something called time. What are the threats to the species and the places they live? What are our interventions? That is, what are you doing to mitigate the threat? How do we monitor? We use camera traps. And then we evaluate the pictures to see if our interventions are working. Are we really making a difference? It's pretty simple. What are the threats? What are you doing? Show me some evidence it's working. If not, change what you're doing. If I see raising awareness and, and outreach in a, in a proposal again, I think I'm going to tear it up. Everybody puts raising awareness and outreach. They're necessary, but they are not sufficient. Here comes the provocative. Raising awareness does not necessarily change behavior. I got this pie in the face at a, at a talk I gave about palm oil. I raised awareness of the dangers of palm oil. And I was told, I'm not gonna change consuming it because I like it. I informed, I raised awareness, and, I, and the result was no change. I read a book called uh, The Political Mind, and on, you know, on page 18 it said, if you believe that giving people the facts, uh, they'll vote your way, you're living in the 18th century. I was living in the 18th century. I actually believed that by giving people facts, they would do the right thing. And it doesn't work. I think you can see that now in our, in our political arena. Um, unfortunately, you know, many academics consider conservation a displacement activity. They want somebody else to do it. Um, and they put in their proposals, raising awareness and outreach. And because it's easy to give a talk, it avoids costly and time-consuming threat reduction efforts like my three months uh, fixing hen houses. Uh, and and uh, academics just don't have time for that. It's not going to be published, so why bother? And that's 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 what's happening. That's what you're seeing, I hope. Human wildlife coexistence is a, con is a subset of wildlife conservation. Notice that I did not say conservation biology. I said wildlife conservation. I reversed the words here. Conservation is a multidisciplinary program requiring social skills, social sciences, language skills, you gotta be able to speak to people, environmental science, ecology, as well as the ability to influence governance. We have to change the rules in some of these countries. You have to be able to talk to people in their own language. And I believe that wildlife conservation is being held hostage in conservation biology departments nationwide. Fundamentally, I believe that. And I consider it to be an existential threat 
the conservation of all wildlife. I don't even know what the word conservation biology means. I know what wildlife conservation is, just like you know what tree conservation is, art conservation, and building conservation, and land conservation, and air conservation, plant conservation. Now let's reverse the words. What's conservation astronomy? How about conservation mathematics, conservation physics? I don't know what those words mean. But if we reverse the words, wildlife conservation, I get it. So do you. I don't have to explain it. I think the word conservation biology leaves a lot open for your imagination. And of course, when we hear things, we always say we hear what we want to hear. So that's that's a sort of an existential threat I have to deal with. Each of our, I'll just go through quickly about how each of our working groups is organized so I can get to questions and answers. Um, we, find, we find and support local partners like Sagar. I use uh, Mohammed Zaid Species Conservation Fund as a, as a very powerful recruiting tool. People apply for grants, you get to see them, newbies apply. Um, and that's how we build a global network. Sagar also suggests his colleagues apply, new colleagues. Sagar is applied. Uh, we create a network to act as our eyes and ears, and we communicate by cell phones. Ashan is a good example with his youth camps, which are here. We partner with and fund existing rescue, rehabilitation, and release centers. When we have a cat that's injured, we know where to go. Here's one here on the left that we built in Sri Lanka. Uh, we do community-based conservation programs involving multiple stakeholders, whoever's involved, we have to have a meeting. We can't be inclusive or we can't be exclusive. We need to include as many people as we can. We have children's program to reduce future threats, a lot of school murals. And we have um, local, regional and national government policy alignment and enforcement. We know a lot of people, a lot of leaders at the government level running government programs that we can work with, colleagues. We have road signs, billboards, reports, constantly hitting the media. Here's, here's Murti with his Mohammed bin Zayed t-shirt talking to a group of kids. And when you're in India, you're talking to a large group of kids. We do surveys, we publish in newspapers. We use time to evaluate what we're doing. And as a last resort, we'll support anti-poaching patrols in protected areas, but we've never done that. In case we ever have to do it, we're prepared. Uh, my colleagues at Refrost, they actually go undercover and stop bust, they bust illegal hunting in Brazil. The guy there in the, in the middle, uh, in the black, wears a, a flak jacket when he goes out hunting with illegal hunting groups. He films them and then he calls the police. People are out there making a difference. Some of them, are putting their uh, lives on the line, but they're making a difference. Uh, J Jamie in the middle is a jewelry salesman, but he is one dynamic conservationist. He sued the government of Brazil over the highway network uh, that has so much wildlife kill and he won the suit. The government has to fix the roads. Jamie did that, he's a jewelry salesman. That's conservation, and anybody can do it. Here's a guy whose goats were predated by clouded leopards. I know I would like to see that. Clouded leopards predating on somebody's goats. Um, we fixed his corral. We helped him grow vegetables. Now he's part of the team, wearing, um, wearing his appropriate logos. We create uh, networks. All over the country where we work, here's Felipe with his hen houses, fixing his hen houses, part of his PhD program. And here's that, here's one where the hen house was fixed. This Joffrey's cat killed 44 chickens in one night. It took one and ate it. Felipe was called in to fix the hen house. The guy was reluctant to, to kill Joffrey's cat. He was in the hen house with his hens and the cat revisited him 
and he's filming it. He called Felipe and he said, I love this cat. I've got to work with my neighbors now to protect him. I know he's killing their chickens. Amazing. Joffrey's cat. Uh, my colleague Carlos in, um, in Chile, where I'll be next week, has a very creative program. Uh, apparently, the Mapuche, uh, the indigenous Mapuche, figured this out a long time ago. That the cats, the way that cats catch the hens, is by the by grasping the tail as the hens are running away. The tail feathers are, in, are intertwined, and so they grab the back of the tail. They they essentially caught caught the chicken. Well, the Mapuche figured out a way to have these hen, breed hens that have no tail feathers or tail bone making it more difficult for the cats to catch. And so here we are, uh, here's a, a picture that uh, Carlos took. We're delivering Mapuche hens to these people who have lost their hens. We fixed their hen house and everybody's happy. And that program has just caught fire because the, the Mapuche hens are, are special, they're expensive in Chile, and Carlos gives them out to the people that we work. We buy the material to fix the hen house and the owners fix the hen house themselves. Um, we don't give them a manual to how to fix it because on earth, there are no two hen houses the same. No manual necessary. Um, we just give them the materials, fix it. And, and, uh, and we don't tell them how to fix it. We show them a video of the cat going in and out of, the, of a hen house, the video that you saw, and the people watch the video and they look at their hen house and they go, yeah, I got to fix that. So we don't tell them how to do it. They see how to do it. Telling them won't work. Here's our little friend, the uh, Cola Cola, Leopardus Cola Cola. Beautiful little cats. Absolutely stunning. And they love chickens. We put up these uh, road signs. And uh, here we're shown with um, a reporter who drove by the road sign. Wow, what's this? She contacted Felipe here in the middle. And um, she interviewed all of us for the nightly news on television. And that was in the state of Rio Grande do Sul. Two nights later, a three minute story aired nationally in Brazil, featuring our sign and our favorite little cat here, uh, Leopardus munoai, uh, a, pampa, a pampa, cat that lives in the pampa. And it was all because of this reporter saw the sign. Moreover, a few days later, um, one of the cats, got nicked by a car and was laying by the side of the road. Two police drove by. The one policeman said, oh, it's just a domestic cat. The other policeman said, no, no, I saw the sign. That's a special cat. Turn around, we got to go get it. They went back, they got it, they put it in the back seat. They waited for it to revive, started wandering around the back seat. They opened the door and let it go. The sign worked. They worked. It saves one cat that's good enough for us. Here's um, a little cat, Uno I from uh, my colleagues Ibera in, in Argentina. And this is the grassland that they live in. It's similar grassland where Maine wolves live. Last few slides here. Quechua women for conservation. So these women are living uh, in Southern Peru at around 4,500 meters, it's where you have trouble breathing and slow down your walking. Um, they really didn't have a voice until Marina came along and said, hey, let's do some conservation together. She organized uh, Quechua Women for Conservation. She herself is born Quechua, speaks Quechua. And she organized this group of women. I know you want one of these hats. You'll have to go there to get one. And this is their first project. 
That's a mural on the side of an adobe house, a mud house. You can see the foundation is mud. That group of Quechua women created that mural. Shown are an Andean cat on the left, IUCN Redless Endangered, Puma, and a pompous cat. They know the cats, they can describe them all, they've seen them, and now they're gonna work with us to prevent the killing of these cats by people with guns who just go there for fun, to kill their wildlife. Quechua Women for Conservation. I'm very excited about it because Bryn is a, a young conservationist. She's very dynamic and she's one determined young woman. In closing, I'd like to say that conservation is a social science, it doesn't belong in biology departments. It's a multidisciplinary program that draws a lot from many different uh, departments. We don't need a new department need a new program. We can use existing departments. We work with children to change the future and we work with adults to make sure there is a future. That's a fishing cat asking if you have any questions. Thank you. <laughs>